All right, we have our final talk of the morning session um, with Dr. Teresa Davis. And so we will be switching back to the podium and I will let her get started. Um, and after that, we will have a lunch break uh, on your own and then we'll move into the animal health section after lunch. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about some of the studies that we've conducted in our lab that have shown that insulin plays an important role in mediating the anabolic response to nutrition in the neonate. So why is understanding the role of nutrition in the regulation of growth important? Well, it's important because the newborn period for piglets presents special difficulties for swine producers. We know that baby pigs have high nutrient requirements for growth. They're also quite vulnerable to respiratory and to GI infections, and that reduces their growth. Their high morbidity and mortality increases costs for swine producers. And if the pigs are born of a low birth weight, this lengthens the time to reach market weight and that reduces uh, or increases costs for swine producers. So anything that we can do to um, develop dietary interventions to optimize their lean growth can improve profitability for swine producers. So in a similar way, low birth weight infants impose large costs on society. Although their survival of low birth weight infants has increased, um, in recent years and their morbidity still remains high. Most of these low birth weight infants are discharged from the hospital weighing less than the 10th percentile for interuterine growth standards. And many of them remain small, even into adulthood. These low birth weight infants are in, at increased risk for having an altered body composition. That is, they are likely to have a lower lean body mass. Their fat mass in absolute terms may be the same or increase, but their lean body mass is very likely to be reduced. And that probably contributes to their increased risk for obesity, for type two diabetes, um, for cardiovascular disease. So if we can develop nutritional interventions um, to improve their lean growth, this should help reduce healthcare costs um, and improve their health outcomes. So my lab has used the neonatal pig as a dual model uh, for animal agriculture and, and biomedicine. So the baby pig is a great model uh, because the anatomy and the metabolism of the baby pig and the human infant is very similar. And so this allows us to identify the mechanisms um, that regulate um, growth and allows us to develop new techniques to improve their nutritional management, which has applications to um, pediatrics, but it also has implications uh, for swine producers to increase the growth of baby pigs. So if we think about it, you know, the baby pigs are large enough, but you can do a lot of things with these newborn pigs that you can't do um, with the rodent species. You can't uh, repeatedly sample blood in a newborn mouse pup. Uh, you can't do tracer kinetics across the hind limb, which you can do in a, a newborn pig. And then, of course, you can vary the diet and feed them in different ways. So it's a great model. And frankly, you know, because it's a great model, this allows our lab to get um, grants from both the NIH and the USDA, which is really rather nice. Okay, so I guess this slide is kind of showing my age here a little bit. But many years ago, um, we established that feeding stimulates protein synthesis in muscle uh, in the baby pigs, and that response decreases with development. So, so here you see fractional rates of protein synthesis in the first month of life. Um, and these baby pigs were just fasted overnight here, or they were fasted and then given one, a meal. And what you can see is a fractional rate of protein synthesis um, increases in response to feeding, but that response is quite profound in the newborn, but it decreases with development. So we then established that feeding stimulates protein synthesis in muscle 
And it does so by eliciting this rise in insulin and a rise in amino acids. And this insulin and amino acids then stimulate the signaling pathways that then in turn uh, stimulate protein synthesis in muscle. So how does the neonate translate these nutrient signals and hormone signals into anabolic signals to stimulate growth? So one way that we looked at this was uh, uh, quite a few years ago now, we developed this technique called the pancreatic substrate clamp technique, where you could very tightly control the insulin levels in the blood, the amino acid levels in the blood, and the glucose levels in the blood. And so what we do, did was to uh, raise insulin levels in the blood up from the fasting, just up to the fed level while we kept amino acids and glucose levels constant. So you know if you raise insulin levels in the blood, glucose and amino acids dive. So we, in this, uh, with this technique, we could control the amino acids and glucose levels in the blood and just look at the independent effects of insulin. And when we did that, what we found is that the insulin alone, independently, would increase protein synthesis. Amino acids alone increase protein synthesis. Now the combination of the two also increase protein synthesis, but no, notice that it's no further than what was seen with either one alone. And really importantly, I think, is that this increase in protein synthesis was much more profound in the newborn than in muscle of the slightly older animal. Even though these two, um, even though these two ages of animals saw the same level of insulin in the blood, the same level of amino acid in the blood, they just responded differently. But also importantly is that that insulin and the amino acids could increase the rate of protein synthesis up to what's seen in the fully fed state. So it could, insulin and, and amino acids independently could reproduce the effect of feeding. Okay, so since insulin and amino acids can stimulate protein synthesis. Then a few years ago, we started looking at the regulation of the insulin signaling pathway and the amino acid signaling pathway and how that regulates protein synthesis. So first of all, what I'm gonna do is just to give you a sort of a cartoon of the insulin signaling pathway and the amino acid signaling pathway, just kind of an overview. And then we'll talk in more detail. Okay, so ingestion of food causes a rise in insulin in the blood. I think everybody in the room knows that. But then when that insulin, the rise in insulin in the blood then stimulates this insulin signaling pathway that leads to the stimulation of mTOR C1, which stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin complex one. So when mTOR becomes activated, this in turn activates these translation initiation factors that regulate the binding of the messenger RNA to the ribosome. And then together with the factors that regulate the binding of methionyl tRNA to the ribosome, increase the synthesis of new proteins. So studies in our lab have shown that the abundance of many of these signaling proteins is much greater in muscle of the newborn. But more importantly, and I think even more interestingly, is that in response to the rise in insulin in the blood, there's an activation of this signaling pathway. And that activation is much more profound in the newborn than it is in muscle of the slightly older animal. Now, we also know that feeding increases amino acid levels in the blood. And then the amino acids signal down to mTOR as well to stimulate translation initiation. And the abundance of some of the um, amino acid signaling proteins are also more abundant in bustle of the newborn, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So let me give you a little bit more detail about the insulin signaling pathway and how that changes with development. So ingestion of food causes a rise in insulin in the blood. And that insulin then binds to the insulin receptor and increases its um, activation by phosphorylation on the tyrosine residues 
which increases the phosphorylation and activation of IRIS-1, activation of PI3 kinase, and this brings AKT to the plasma membrane where it binds and increases its activity. Now, activation of AKT, and we know that you know, AKT is sometimes called, also referred to as protein kinase B or PKB. So when AKT becomes activated, it increases the phosphorylation and deactivates. So the inhibitor TSC2, which causes TSC2 to release its inhibition of mTOR. Okay, how is this pathway altered with development? Okay, so what we sh showed in our experiments is that if you raise insulin, just from the fasting up to the fed level, that that insulin increases AKT phosphorylation. And that response decreases with development. And that feeds downstream to TSC2, and then to mTOR. But what you see is with AKT, insulin increases the phosphorylation and activation of AKT, but amino acids have no effect. But when we move downstream to mTOR, you see both insulin and amino acids have an effect on increasing the phosphorylation of mTOR. And that's because mTOR is getting a stimulus from both insulin and from amino acids and that response decreases with development. Now, so let's go downstream. We know that mTOR can be activated by insulin, but also by amino acids as well. And so when mTOR uh, increases activity, then that increases the phosphorylation of S6K1 and ribosomal protein S6, which increases the translation of specific mRNAs it also increases the phosphorylation of 4EBP1 and the association of EIF4E with EIF4G, which binds to the messenger RNA, increases translation initiation and protein synthesis. So how does that change with development? So here we're looking at S6K1 and ribosomal protein S6. And you can see these are downstream um, of mTOR. And here you see that both amino acids and insulin increase their phosphorylation and that decreases with development. And going downstream to phosphorylation of 4EBP1 and the association of EIF4E with EIF4G that binds to the messenger RNA and increases translation initiation, a profound effect of amino acids and insulin, but that decreases with development. So I think you can clearly see here from these experiments that the feeding induced stimulation of protein synthesis in muscle is due to the activation of both the insulin signaling pathway and amino acid signaling pathway. And that leads to a stimulation and translation initiation and protein synthesis, but that decreases with development. So we know that when we eat, insulin and amino acids rise, but then they decrease. So there's a cyclical pattern, right, of insulin and amino acids. So does that cyclical pattern of insulin and amino acids that's induced by meal uh, feeding, can that impact growth? Do you need to have this cyclical pattern or can you just have, you know, high levels of insulin and amino acids? And why is that even important? Well, it's important, I think, for a number of reasons. One of them is that, you know, our nutrient requirements um, are reported as daily requirements. And there's nothing said about how should those requirements be distributed across the course of the day. In addition, many low birth weight infants are fed continuously, either by orogastric tube or by total parental nutrition through their um, veins. So we wanted to understand um, whether this anabolic response to meal feeding um, um, is important. So a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, um, Carolina um, Gazzaneo, wanted to address this question. So what she did was to take baby pigs and one group she fed continuously, just um, infuse them continuously with food by orogastric tube. And so of course, insulin levels are low and constant, right? But then she took another group and she meal fed them. So she meal, meal fed them every four hours. And so you see when you're meal fed, you know, your insulin rises and then it falls 
and then goes down to baseline and then another meal is given, insulin rises again. So you, there's a cyclical pattern of insulin as well as amino acids. So how does this affect the signaling proteins that regulate protein synthesis? Well, first she looked at AKT phosphorylation, which is a, a good biomarker of activation of the insulin signaling pathway. And what she found is if she fed continuously just at a constant flow rate, um, into the stomach, that phosphorylation of AKT is pretty low. It's not all that much different or not significantly different from fasting, a little bit higher, but not significantly. And then for the meal fed group, she measured AKT phosphorylation just before the meal and, and it's low. Um, but then when she gave them a meal, AKT phosphorylation increased. So it really spiked after the meal was given. And that fed downstream to the translation initiation factors here represented by the association of EIF4E with EIF4G. And you see there's that spike um, in the activation of these signaling proteins after the meal is given. No surprise, then what you see is an increase in protein synthesis after meal. So the rate of protein synthesis after the meal is given is much higher than in those that are continuously fed. But what we're really interested in is, does this affect growth? So at Samar El Khadi, who was a postdoc in the lab and it's now at Virginia Tech, um, wanted to address this question. And so what he did was to meal feed or continuously feed for 21 days. And what he found is that when he meal fed for 21 days, you see the body weight was higher. It actually started getting higher even at nine days of age. And so meal feeding enhanced body weight. Now these two groups of animals consume the same amount of nutrients, same amount of nutrients, but yet their body weight was higher when they were meal fed. Not only was their body weight higher, but their linear growth was higher as well. This increase in body weight was due to an increase in lean mass. And in fact, fat mass was no different between the two groups. So it's truly an increase in lean mass. And this increase in lean mass was due to an increase in muscle mass, which uh, occurred in muscles of different fiber type, like the longissimus dorsi muscle, which is a fast twitch glycolytic muscle, also in the slow twitch oxidative muscles, like the soleus muscle. So certainly timing of which nutrients are delivered really does matter. And this is because with meal feeding, you get this cyclical pattern of insulin and amino acids, which activates the signaling pathways that stimulates protein synthesis and that enhances lean growth. But with continuous feeding, that low level of insulin as well as amino acids mutes these signaling pathways and really restricts lean growth. So I think these studies clearly showed that meal feeding does promote protein anabolism. So all of those studies that I described were conducted in healthy term pigs, healthy pigs that were born at term. But really what our experiments are targeting is how can we develop techniques to improve the growth of low birth weight pigs, and low birth weight infants, and, and, and most low birth weight infants are born prematurely. So we wanted to address this question. So does low being born of a low birth weight or premature, prematurely alter the protein metabolic response to nutrition? Okay, so what evidence do we have that it might be altered? Okay, so the data that I showed you early on in the talk showed that there are developmental changes in protein synthesis. So if you're born at term, um, and feeding can quite profoundly increase protein synthesis, and that decreases with development. But what happens if you're born prematurely? Do, do you have just a continuation of that developmental change so that the muscle protein synthesis rates are higher? You know. That's a possibility, particularly when you think about studies that have been done in the fetal rat, 
um, where protein synthesis was measured in muscle just before birth. In those animals, the muscle has a higher rate of protein synthesis in those fetal rats than in the rats that are born at term. So potentially protein synthesis rates could be higher. On the other hand, remember in the early part of this talk, I said that lean body mass is lower in preterm infants, um, even when measured at term equivalent age. Um, so at low birth weight infants at ter term equivalent age have a lower lean mass than those that are born at term. So it's possible that the protein metabolic response to feeding is actually lower in the preterm pigs. So we needed to find out. So Jane Maberheis, who was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, wanted to take on this question. And so what she did was to de deliver pigs by C-section prematurely, uh, so about 10 days early, but this is equivalent to a preterm infant being born at 32 weeks of gestation. And then she also delivered another group of pigs at term, uh, but, but by C-section. So she took these <clears throat> baby pigs and she fed them by total parental nutrition for three days. And then after that three days, then she either fasted them for four hours, just a very short period of time, or she um, fasted them for four hours and then gave them their first enteral meal. So this is the first time that they're seeing food come into the stomach and intestines. So when she did that, so first of all, looking at the birth weight of these preterm pigs. So not surprisingly, birth weight of preterm pigs are lower than in the term, but importantly, the weight gain. So this is relative weight gain expressed per kilo body weight. The weight gain just over those three days is much lower in the preterm and the term, despite the fact that their nutrient delivery was the same. The weight of their muscle, at least for the longitudinal dorsi muscle, was lower in the preterm than in the term, and liver weight was higher. And this is expressed per kilo body weight. Okay, so in the preterm, what happens with insulin and amino acids in response to a meal? So what we see is the plasma insulin levels in response to their first meal in these preterm and term pigs. So in the orange is the term and the blue is the preterm. So what you can see is that in response to the meal, that rise in insulin in the blood is much slower here in the preterm than in the term, although they reach the same level after um, 60 minutes. And the same is the case for glucose and amino acids. It's a slower rise, but they eventually get there. Okay. So what happens for protein synthesis? Because in this experiment, this is our, you know, this is our primary outcome. So here in this graph, you're, we're looking at the rate of protein synthesis in muscle of the preterm and the term when these animals are fasted just for four hours, but they're fasted or they're fasted and then given a meal. And what you see is there's an increase in protein synthesis in the preterm and in the term but the rate of protein synthesis is lower in these preterm pigs than the term. And that occurs, occurs in muscles of different fiber types here, showing the longestimus dorsi and the gastrocnemus muscle. So what are the key regulatory molecules that's involved in this differential response of muscle defeating in the preterm versus the term? Okay, so let's start out at the top of the insulin signaling pathway. Let's look at the phosphorylation of the insulin receptor, IRIS-1, and then the association of the insulin receptor with PI3 kinase in the preterm and the term. So first of all, looking at the insulin receptor and the phosphorylation on the tyrosine residues, which would increase uh, its activation. So we can see clearly that feeding increases the phosphorylation of the insulin receptor in the preterm and the term, but we couldn't pick up any differences between the preterm and the term, nor could we pick up any differences in the phosphorylation of IRIS-1 or the activation of PI3 kinase. No difference between the preterm and the term. 
But then we went downstream looking at AKT phosphorylation and the phosphorylation of TSC2. And what we found is that there is an increase in the phosphorylation of AKT on both sites a, of the serine 473 and 3 and 308, which is needed uh, for full activation of uh, AKT. We see a profound effect of feeding on um, phosphorylation of AKT in the preterm and in the term, but it's lower in the preterm than term. So here you see a blunting of the effect of um, AKT in the preterm. And this feeds downstream to the phosphorylation of TSC2, a lower effect in the preterm than in the term. Okay, so I haven't said too much about the insulin signaling pathway. So I'm gonna introduce this here and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about it. So it's, there's a lot of models that have been proposed for how amino acids actually signal down um, to mTOR to activate it. And so the most widely accepted uh, model that's been proposed is that when amino acids are transported into the cell, that activates mTOR or mTOR C1, mechanistic target of rapamycin complex one. And that it does so by these RAG proteins bringing mTOR to the lysosomal surface where it can be, um, um, where it can bind to the regulator proteins and REB uh, and become activated. So there have been some amino acid sensors that have been identified, uh, one of them being the sensor for leucine, and that is Cestrin-2. So what happens, at least it's um, believed to occur, is that when leucine rises in the cell, the leucine binds to Cestrin-2, pulls it away from Gator-2, so that the Gators can release their inhibition of mTOR and increase the activation of mTOR. Okay, so what happens with uh, feeding and uh, is there an effect of prematurity? So in response to feeding, the association of Cestrin-2 with Gator-2 here um, decreases. And that's what you would expect because this is an inhibitory complex. So if you're feeding, that reduces. The leucine binds to Cestrin-2 and um, pulls it away but we couldn't pick up any effect of prematurity. But when we went downstream looking at these RAG proteins and the association of the RAG proteins with mTOR, as well as REB with mTOR, what we can see is the activation increases in response to feeding, but that's really blunted in the preterm compared to the term. Now going downstream uh, to the translation initiation factors, the phosphorylation of mTOR, as well as the phosphorylation of S6K1 and ribosomal protein S6, as well as 4EBP1, it would be no surprise to you now that, that the response increases um, in response to feeding, but that response is really blunted in the preterm. So a much lower response in the preterm versus the term. So I think those studies clearly showed that prematurity blunts this feeding-induced activation of the insulin and amino acid signaling pathway leading to protein synthesis. And that likely contributes to the extrauterine growth faltering of prematurity. So that's what happens with prematurity, but you know, is this anabolic resistance that we just saw in the preterm, is that because they're born early? Or is that because they're of a low birth weight? You know, which is, what, what's the primary factor here? Okay, so um, I'm in Texas, and it's hard to get a lot of sows <laughs> in Texas. So, you know, it, it, when you think about, when you're trying to look at low birth weight, you need a lot of sows to produce, you know, a lot of baby pigs, because low birth weight, you know, is usually defined as um, the lowest 10% uh, body weight um, of your uh, litter. So instead of getting about 20 or 30 sows in order to investigate this question, what we did was to um, look at the spread of bo body weight across the pigs that we had. So we know in this 
group that we just described in this experiment that we just described, we looked at the birth weight um, in the in the preterm and in the term. So in the preterm pigs, they ranged in body weight from about 300 grams to 1400 grams. And the term pigs range from about 600 to about 1700. So of course, birth weight was lower in the preterm than in the term. But what Marco Rudar, who was a postdoc in the lab wanted to do was then just to stratify these pigs by birth weight. So what he is doing here is comparing the highest birth weight pigs um, that are preterm, so the in the blue, the highest birth weight preterms and the lowest birth weight term pigs. So that the, the birth weight of these two subsets of pigs are the same. So he's using preterm pigs and term pigs that are the same birth weight. So this is a subset of pigs. And when he did this, what he found is that, you know, we got a similar uh, result in that when we call compare preterm and term, that this response to feeding was still lower in the preterm than in the term, despite the fact that they had the same body weight. So that was the case when we looked at insulin signaling, as well as amino acid signaling, a lower response in the preterm than in the term, despite the fact that these pigs had the same body weight using this subset of pigs. And that fed downstream to the translation initiation factors, a lower response in the preterm and the term pigs that had the same body weight in that subset of pigs and a lower rate of protein synthesis. And not surprisingly, then their body weight gain was lower, despite the fact that those that subset of pigs had the same body weight. So I th think you can see from that, that despite the fact that they had similar birth weights in this subset of preterm and term pigs, that the preterm pigs exhibited a reduced activation of insulin and amino acid signalings leading to translation initiation and protein synthesis. And that it seems likely you know, from this data that prematurity rather than being born of a low birth weight itself reduces the anabolic response to feeding and contributes to the reduced lean mass accretion um, in premature infants. Now, you remember in that experiment that I showed you um, where we looked at the, the, um, the change in insulin and amino acids after a meal in the preterm in the term, there is that slower rise in insulin and amino acids. So we, we wondered, is this, this blunting of the effect um, on, in preterm in the term, is it because they had a lower level of insulin and amino acids in the blood in, initially? Or is that resistance at the end organ level? Is that resistance in muscle? So in order to do that, we could go back to our technique, which I described a few minutes ago, um, looking at um, the uh, using the pancreatic substrate clamp. So here I'm just showing you that in that data, I previously showed you that there's that slower rise in insulin, slower rise in amino acids, but eventually it got to the same level. So we thought it was important to do these pancreatic substrate clamps. So Marco Rudar and, and uh, Jane Neverheis um, paired together and use a, a, using a similar sort of model, uh, delivering pigs by C-section either at term or preterm, and then feeding them by total parenteral nutrition by three days. So instead of then giving them a meal, what they did was to perform these pancreatic substrate clamps where we studied preterm and term pigs that were uh, had glucose, insulin, and amino acids maintained at the fasting level, or another group where we rose insulin just up to the fed level, keeping everything else the same, or we increased amino acids in the blood uh, and kept glucose and insulin the same. So here's the data just to show you that we were successful in doing our clamps um, and that glucose levels were maintained across the fasting level during the clamp procedure, and that we reached our targeted insulin levels in both the preterm and the term. And you see there's no significant difference in the insulin level that we achieved in the preterm and the term. 
And the same was the case for amino acid group, no difference in the preterm and the term. So they're seeing the same level of insulin in the blood and the same level of um, amino acid in the blood in these preterm and the term. So when we did that, what we find is that raising the insulin level in the blood in these preterm uh, increased AKT phosphorylation, but that response was lower in the preterm than in the term. And that fed downstream to TSC2 and to the association of Reb with mTOR, a lower response uh, in the preterm than in the term. The same was the case with amino acid signaling, a lower response to amino acids in the preterm than in the term. And then feeding downstream to translation initiation signaling pathway, a lower response in the preterm than in the term for both insulin and amino acid. And that resulted in a lower rate of protein synthesis in the preterm than in the term. So I think these studies clearly showed that there is anabolic resistance to feeding with preterm birth. And that results in, uh, likely results in a lower lean growth. Okay, uh, now I don't wanna keep you away from your meal feeding. <laughs> So, um, so I'll just like to thank my co-investigators, uh, particularly Marta Furato and Doug Burren, uh, a host of postdoctoral fellows in the lab and our funding agencies. And so if anyone has someone who's looking for a postdoctoral fellowship, uh, please see me <laughs> because we're looking for good postdoctoral fellows within my lab, but also in the uh, overall program in the Children's Nutrition Research Center at Baylor College of Medicine. So on behalf of my lab, I thank you for your attention. So any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you.